Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and today's episode is Word Association number seven. If you've not been around for one of these episodes, yes, so that's this many. If you've not been around for the Word Association episodes, you're missing out. They're a heck of a lot of fun. This is where Andrew and a bunch of you try to, let's say, stump me, in a sense, to give me words. And it doesn't have to be to stump me, but the general premise is take concepts or words that are generally considered unrelated to martial arts. And my job is to relate them to martial arts in some way that makes me think and thus hopefully makes you think. And they're fun. Andrew and I have a good time. If nobody else, and that's okay. Today's episode is going to be available in audio and video. It's all over the place. Remember, we, we, we do video on every episode now. I don't know the last time we didn't do video on an episode. So you can find us on YouTube if you want to see our collective uh, cranial shine. You can check that out. Uh, but you can also check out Safest Family on the Block. So uh, we have our second sp sponsor. We had Kataro a few weeks ago, and now we have Safest Family on the Block. Some of you may know Jason Brick. He's been on the show. I've been on his show. Longtime friend, great guy. I've had the chance to train with him a little bit. And he founded a, I guess we can call it a company, a podcast, a, a, a thing called Safest Family on the Block. And you could probably infer from the name what it is. It's great stuff. He's putting together some wonderful material. And really the root of Safest Family on the Block is a podcast that brings together Jason's experience with martial arts and journalism and parenting. And he brings on experts. I was on the show. I don't know if we want to call me an expert, but he brings on <laughs> some pretty incredible people that know stuff about everything you might think of involved in family safety. You know, here, when we talk about martial arts, you know, we, we, we stretch the bounds of what we call self-defense. And we talk about some of these things, but Jason doesn't have to stretch the bounds because the format he set up is, is just headlong into it. It's self-defense and crime prevention, of course, but it's also fire safety and driving safety and emergency preparedness and mental health and basically anything else you could think of that kind of fits a uh, paradigm of safe and family. You know, Andrew, you've got kids. I'm sure you're, you're thinking of other things. Oh, yeah, this it, is relevant. His, this is relevant. It's, it's very inclusive. He's got a lot of stuff yeah, it, it wrapped up in this he's got project. It's really cool. And three years after starting the show, he did a book. 101 tips and tricks and habits and things to make your family safer. And it's got some great stuff. Um, I've got a section in the book, but there are other names in the book that you that are so much bigger than mine, which <laughs> I was really humbled that he invited me in. And he's offering 25% off this book. So I think you should check it out. Wow. Uh, use the code WHISTLEKICK23 for 25% off. And check out the book. Find him on Instagram and Facebook. Save his family on the block. It's going to be a link in the show notes to this stuff. So check it out. Whistlekick23. 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 Awesome. And of course, if you want to support Whistlekick, you're doing the thing that we asked you to do. You're checking out the show. But don't forget, you can use the code podcast15 and hang out, join the Patreon, all kinds of good stuff. So, Andrew, my friend, are yes. you ready? I am ready. I have on my phone here a list of words uh, that we are going to, that I'm going to ask you. I say we because, you know, sometimes listeners send them in. So you guys are, you know, all part of the collective we are going to ask not, you not these. The French word for yes. It's it's we. It's not we. That's right. That's right. And so uh, I'm going to ask you these, uh, or give you these words, and you're going to try and somehow find a way to relate them to martial arts somehow. Sounds good to me. Are you ready? Sure. All right. Word number one, FM radio. FM radio. So if you think about the period of time of communication of, let's say, the spoken word, FM radio came on pretty hard, pretty fast and has been in a decline for a very long time. You can tune into FM radio. It's in your car, most likely. But when was the last time, Andrew, when was the last time you listened to the radio? Do you listen to the radio when you drive? I don't think you do. So when I bring guy. my daughter to school, she only wants the radio. So yes, I listen to the radio fairly often. Okay. But I only listen to it for like five minutes to school and then five minutes back home. Yeah. And 
what I think is interesting about FM radio is, is not it's so much it as a technology, but it in contrast. Think about FM radio versus podcast versus AM radio. AM radio is still fairly large. AM radio hasn't lost much in terms of listenership. The audio quality isn't as good. It's not as great for music, but it has such longer reach. And so for the spoken word, it works pretty well. Podcasts, you could say the same thing. You can certainly download. Some, some shows offer very, very high audio quality. We try to find a balance between audio quality and file size. But FM radio came up and it's coming down. And if we think about trends in the martial art, trends in anything, well, let's talk about trends in the martial arts. We have those, right? There were periods of time in the 80s where everybody wanted to be a ninja. We still all want to be ninjas, but uh, the, the ninja movie, like Show Kasugi, right? Like just, I mean, how many people know that name from martial arts films in the 80s? And people walking around wearing ninja uniforms and, and you know, tabby boots, right? Like, but everything that comes up fast tends to come down fast. And we see that in, in, I mean, I see that all the time in business. If something screams up, it's probably not going to last. And to me, that FM radio, if we take a step back for radio technology and communication technology, does kind of fit that. Very fast up. And now, go, if, if you think, oh, well, FM, you know, it's, uh, it's still out there. See how many jobs are available. You have these groups that cover these huge geographic areas and they're relaying between towers. You know, there might be five or six people doing what a hundred people were doing just 10 years ago. All right. Are you ready for the next one? That was good. That was pretty good. Uh, so this one, uh, my wife and I often, we go down to Cape Cod <laughs> vacation sometimes. And down there is, uh, a, Ocean, oceanographic and atmosphere place that's called Hui, but the larger organization is the, this is your word, the National no. Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So do I have to run with that sequence of four words or do am I running with the, the letters? It doesn't matter, whatever. Noah? No, sure, Noah. <laughs> so I'm not going to go there. There's a very, there's a private joke that involves an expletive that I'm not going to run with. Um, but just had to call attention to it for those of you who, who understand. Um, but what, is, what does NOAA do, right? What is the National Oceanic Atmospheric? Administration. Yeah. So administration, you know, what are they doing? Oh, no, it, it is association. There? Okay. What are they doing? They're looking at weather and atmospheric trends. They're pulling a lot of data. It's a data organization. They look at all the data that's out there and they, they, they're able to look at, here's what happened and that's what we think is going to happen. And they're not so concerned with, okay, here's the weather in your town today, right? This is not micro, these are macro trends. And one of the things that martial arts is a little bit behind the ball on is responding to macro shifts in society. And we're playing a bit of catch up now with that. And some examples, it was not that relatively, not that long ago that martial arts curriculums in some schools and still not all dealt with firearms. And a lot of them that do deal with firearms, I'm sorry to say, deal very, very improperly, very poorly with firearms. And I'm not going into that, but just acknowledging that firearms, martial arts, right? It took a long time. Firearms have been around a very long time. But when I was growing up, we really didn't have firearms defense. It's stuff that was kind of figured out, right? Now we've got people who are like, okay, this is what we've got to do. We've spent some time figuring it out, but you know, a hundred years later, there are plenty of other things that we haven't responded to. Martial arts, educational trends, the way we teach classes are still very much behind the times in terms of academic theory, which is part of why 
we have MATIC, the Martial Art Teacher Training and Certification Division of Whistlekick, but also fail to acknowledge the realities of where kids are at in terms of mental health and what is expected of them during the day, um, growing trends in um, autism spectrum or you know similar terms, right? This is not my, my valley wick, but I, I think it'll all get there with me. We're being reactive. And if we could come together and do a better job with some forecasting, with pulling big macro data, we could set some of the stuff out and we could do a better job of saying, okay, I'm going to do what I do. You do what you do. You do what you do. But if we all come together and, and put our resources together and say, okay, this is what's going on with people. We can choose how to interpret that data and take action based on the perception. All right. So uh, next word is going to be check mark. Check mark is what everybody wants to be able to do with their martial arts training. Because a check mark says, I did this, it's done. I don't need to do it again, it's over. Nothing is ever over in the martial arts. You might be done with your test, but if you don't continue to practice those skills and you remember those forms, practice that, whatever, it fades. And it's one of the reasons that I think in Western culture, we struggle with getting broader martial arts adoption because people want to check boxes. They want to go do a six week program, a 30 day of this, a seven week that. Martial arts is ongoing. A lot of martial arts schools find success bringing people in by having six week, you know, intro to martial arts program. So you try it and it's, it's, it's finite. They can check the box. And if they want to go deeper, they go deeper. But for a lot of people, I notice that they reject the things that as many things as they can, they, they can't check the box on. I think this is part of why people don't like forms. Because hmm. I can spend a bunch of time getting really good at a form. And if I don't continue to practice it, I'm no longer as good at it. Incidentally, the same people who would do that think that they can do that with their sparring. They're fighting. So, <laughs> it doesn't <geez>. work. <laughs> All right. Next What word. we do is not a checkbox pursuit. Yeah. Good call. Good call. All right. Next word. Paul Revere. Who's Who came up with this one? Who what do I have to hit? <laughs> I'm trying to think of any of the kind of the, the founders of any of the Okinawan styles were Paul Revere-esque, and I don't think I know enough detail to say yes. Um, why is Paul Revere famous? One if by land, two if by sea, the redcoats are coming. Mm -hmm. um, provided a warning. Uh, he actually had a, from what I understand, a much larger role as a founding father, and we just kind of re reduce it down to that one night. I could give an answer that's very similar to the checkbox one, but I won't. Pardon me as my eyes wander around while I'm trying to roll through this. We right, are trying to stump you. We are trying to stop me, and I appreciate that. I like thinking How about this. Paul Revere had a role. He had a role to play, a role that was acknowledged. He took on that role. People trusted him, and he got it done. He made sure everybody had what they needed at the time they needed it so they would be prepared. We live in a world where we expect that we are surrounded by Paul Revere's and we are not. We expect, many of us, and I would say most of, of Western culture, expects that when push comes to shove, someone will help. Someone will come out of the woodwork, um, whether it's law enforcement or a good Samaritan, that we will not have to face these things on our own, whatever they may be. That is not the reality. 
I'm not going to connect dots any further than that because it starts to get political adjacent and that's not what you do on the show. But I would encourage people to recognize that you are the only one that is truly responsible for you and your well-being and take appropriate action. Okay, good. Uh, next one, a bear den. Like roar? Sure. Yeah, like a like a like a den, like a where bears would hibernate or whatever. Okay. Okay. Not an empty den room in a house. Okay. I mean, it was given to me just as the word den, and I chose to add bear den. I guess it could be den as an empty room in a house. Yeah. Okay. All right. Got it. So what is a den? A den is where bears go to hibernate. They hang out. They feel safe. They feel comfortable. They are protected. There aren't a whole lot, you know, we don't, we haven't built our society around, oh, I'm going to go hang out for four or five months and just chill, right? Things would be really different. You know, we, we would have probably a room in the house that basically like a panic room in everybody's house, right? Be, just, you know, it's got a bed and, you're, and you sleep for five months. Great. But we don't have that. But it doesn't mean we don't need the same thing. The idea that we are always on, our training is always on, we're always at 100% is it's ridiculous. Most people are not doing themselves a service training five, six, seven days a week. Most people are going to be best at two to three days a week. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't train more often. But it does mean you probably shouldn't be training at 100% every day. What happens to a bear when they hibernate? Well, they, they lose weight because you know they're hanging out, they're not eating. And people get really concerned when they stop training for a little while that they're going to lose everything. How quickly does the bear get back their body weight when they come out of hibernation? It's not that long. Just as if we take a break from training, whether it's for a couple of days or a couple of weeks or a couple of months, even a couple of years, it comes back much faster than you think. The more time you have in, the longer you can tolerate a break without ma major degradation in skill or knowledge. It comes back fast. So don't be afraid to crawl into your den, literal or figurative, from time to time, take a rest, Shake off what needs to be shaken off. Because if I asked anybody on the planet, I want you to get ready to run as fast as you can, what would every single person do? They would take a step back. All right. Uh, I'm going to throw an audible and throw a, a word in that wasn't on my list. Because you're thinking of talking about bears got me thinking about camping for whatever reason. So camping. Camping. Why is camping fun? Because it strips off the unnecessary. A lot of people like camping because it gets back to basics. You know, why else would you spend a day packing up stuff that you need into a car to drive somewhere and live a lower caliber quality standard of life for a few days and then come back and unpack everything? Because there's a simplicity. There's something that we appreciate by not having all the trappings of life, not having home, not having to worry about bills. And we often do the same thing with our training. For a lot of us, we go into our training because it's a period of time where we're not worried about all the other stuff. We've talked about it on the show, that if someone's trying to punch you in the face, it's really hard to think about other things. You have to be present. And there's also, I, I think another way to think about this a lot of us really enjoy training in nature. Camping is generally in nature. You could camp somewhere else, I guess, but generally we're in nature. And there's a lot of benefits to training in nature, including, you know, just having a different environment, uneven ground, a bunch of stuff like that. But yeah, I did camping. All right. Next one hot dogs. Gross. Never liked a hot dog. I think you don't have to like it to to relate it to martial arts somehow. It's true. 
It's true. Um, hot dogs. I'm trying. I'm trying to come up with some. I'm trying to come up with the hot dogs are the insert style here of martial arts. Everyone seems to like them when they're children, but once they realize what's in it, they they decide they're gross and they're not going to eat them anymore. Uh, but I can't come up with a style that actually fits that. Uh, nor would I even if I could. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Hot dogs are, let's see, they're fairly ubiquitous, right? And, and they're, I think they're an example of one of these foods that is, for most people, we eat them in terms of tradition more so than taste, right? A lot of people will get a hot dog if they go to a baseball game because it's what they do at a baseball game. Or they had hot dogs, you know, for a lot of people, a hot dog on the grill means summer to them. Right. Hot dog is a, a food that's really rooted in tradition. Even if it's not everyone's first choice. I don't know too many people who choose a hot dog over other things, right? Just, it's an option. And for most of us, there are techniques like that. You know, it's like, yeah, everybody knows how to do this. And I'm intentionally not naming anything. Everybody knows how to do this movement and it exists and we all know it. But... I'd never use it. Yeah, we have hot yeah. dog movements. I, I like that you went with the tradition that I hadn't thought of as well. That you know, like hot dogs are steeped in tradition for at least here in the United States. Um, and and I don't like to. I, I personally enjoy hot dogs as an adult. I don't like to call them hot dogs. I like to call them by their fun name, the Frankfurter, just because it's fun. It's much more fun. <laughs> All right, you ready for your next word? I'm ready. Wood, not woods, not nature, but wood. W-O-O-D, like a board. Correct. Or a plank. Yep. Okay. Well, it's the obvious. Most of us have broken boards before. They are made of wood most of the time. Feels awfully simple, though. No, nope. that's where we're going. Boards, okay. wood, break them, learn things. All right. Um, wear and tear. Wear and tear. Yep. Okay. Wear and tear happens by being alive, right? And just everything we do breaks down the body at least a little bit. And when we sleep, theoretically, we repair. Sometimes wear and tear is greater than one sleep session will repair. And we have to crawl into our den, literally or figuratively, and repair that damage. But as martial artists, because so many of us are hell-bent on training some certain number of days a week. You know, we've had people on the show, I've trained every day for 40 years. Really? I'm, I'm, that's great. And, and I hope you're proud of that. But I'm going to guess that there were days you probably shouldn't have. Hmm. There were days that your body would have benefited more by not... And the older we get, and the more we compound any deficit of wear and tear, the more we run the risk of injury. Why am I tomorrow turning 44 and in the best shape of my life? Because I know when to take a step back. I know when to hibernate. I know when to let my body rest because of the wear and tear. I've learned where appropriate wear and tear is, what it looks like, what it feels like, and how to recover from it. You know, there are a lot of people that just think it's inevitable. Your knees are going to fall apart. You're, you know, I'm a martial artist, so I'll have, to, I'll have to replace my hips. There are plenty of things that make you more predisposed, but nothing is guaranteed. There's nothing that's, that's required of that. That's why we made the knee clinic program. You don't have to have crummy knees as a martial artist. All right. Last word. Are you ready? I'm ready. Mail. M-A-I-L. Okay. Uh, the mail or the post, perhaps, if you live across the pond. Uh, the notion of sending letters or packages to people through this service. 
prior to the internet was the main way that people learned martial arts other than being there, right? Because what would you do? You would send away for, you'd send a check in the mail, right? Remember <laughs> doing that? You'd write a check and you would put it in an envelope and send it away and not know when they got it and not yep. know when they were going to send it. And they would send back to you DVDs or if you're older, VHS tapes of somebody doing something martial arts. It was the easiest way to cross train. And most of us were looking in the back of magazines and seeing these things and sending away for them, right? It's, that involves the mail. But at the end of the day, what was that? It was us looking for more. It was us looking to cross train, to experience something that maybe somebody was teaching that, you know, you were never going to see them on YouTube because it wasn't a thing. You lived somewhere where they probably weren't teaching a seminar. So you couldn't go train with them personally. Well, having these tapes or these discs kind of the next best option. But the only reason it worked was because of the mail. You would never be able to afford those VHF tapes if somebody had to drive them to your house outside of a government funded and controlled postal service. Cool. Great job, man. There were some uh, some tougher yeah. ones in there. There were. There were. You guys are making me stretch and I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. If you like what we do, remember, we're here to connect, educate, and entertain. Go to whistlekick.com. Check out all the things that we got going there, the projects, the products. Buy something using the code PODCAST15. We have an ever-growing list of events. Some are free. Some are not. Make sure you're checking those out and staying in touch. Get on the newsletter list so you can know when we're going to be around because otherwise we have to mail things to you. <laughs> and we're willing to do that. And of course, don't forget to support today's sponsor, Safest Family on the Block. Use the code WHISTLEKICK23 to save 25% on Jason's incredible book packed with some really, really great information. I think you're going to find some good stuff in there. And the best way to engage with Jason and everything that he's built out as a brand, Safest Family on the Block on Instagram and Facebook, and you can spider off from there. And even, you know what? Even if you say, you know, Jeremy, I don't want a book, please go go check out what he's doing. At the very least, support these sponsors that we're bringing on because they're supporting the show and they're helping us grow. And we need your support of them because you never know what you simply knowing about what these companies do. You might bump into somebody who says, you know, I feel like I've got to do more for my family. Well, I just read about this book. I just heard about this book. And you can direct them. And you can use the code, give them the code whistlekick23 to save 25%. Anything else we should mention? No, I think that's phase great. here. Good. All right, great. Well, I appreciate everyone being here. Thanks for coming on. Until next time, train, train hard, hard, smile, and have, smile and have a great day. You know what I just realized? What? I could have been using the microphone in my earbuds and not the microphone on my camera. So oh. the next one we're going to do is going to sound even better. Okay, All great. right. I am stopping.